Hey y'all, welcome to the Coyote Trapping School podcast. This is the second part of the uh, Stephen Van Tassel interview, Wildlife Control Consultant. Reach out to Stephen if you got any questions, if you want to know more about his books, um, or he's got them on his website, wildlifecontrolconsultant.com, or his contact information is wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com, if I uh, believe in, uh, got that right. Um, but anyway, this is part two of the interview. Uh, this this portion, we kind of get get a little bit deeper into the uh, National Wildlife Control Operators Organ- uh, Association, NUCOA, and um, just some just some kind of general things um, related to not just trapping uh, or not just um, wildlife control, but also trapping as well. And uh, I, th- I think it's, again, I think it's a really valuable interview, really valuable information that uh, we as trappers need to be paying attention to and uh, need to need to think about, regardless of whether we're trying to be wildlife control operators or whether we're just fur trappers or whether we're just fun trappers, whatever we are. Um, I don't know that there's many, many fur, I guess a lot of people are fur trappers anymore, whether you're making money at it or not, that's, uh, that's uh, something else. But anyway, before we get into the episode, we def- definitely have to thank our sponsors, Cotch Bros Lures. If you need anything, now is the time to get it. Between now and April 30th, uh, you can get 13% off of their whole site, except for traps, uh, using code 13, typed out, spelled out, 13, the number T-H-I-R-T-E-E-N, 13, gets 30, 13% off of everything on the site, except traps. That's good through April 30th. And as an extra kicker, um, they're also doing 25% off of books and DVDs, uh, just because people are locked down. It's you know plenty of time for some of us to watch uh watch a few extra trapping videos and learn something else whether we're locked in or not we always need to be learning right so that's a great opportunity use the code stay safe s-t-a-y-s-a-f-e for that uh and you can use both codes and get 25 percent off your books and dvds and 13 percent off of anything else on the website except traps so be sure to hit them up before april 30th tell them chris sent you over at coyote trapping school um we want to make sure that they know that uh we're supporting them and, and where we're coming from um, so I appreciate y'all supporting Koch Bros. Appreciate y'all supporting and listening to the podcast. And uh, if you want to support directly the Coyote Trapping School podcast, uh, be sure to come holler at me, hit me up. Um, I'm working on getting a page up on the website for selling some of my beaver tail and other leather items. But we are always kind of got some beaver tail stuff going. We got front pocket wallets. We got bifolds. Um, we got the roper wallets. Bang. All beaver tail caught tan right here in the good old usa right here in georgia um and got a few uh even got a few keychains beaver tail keychains look at that that's classy nice uh brass so hit me up i'm making all this right here this is this is where the magic happens um and also i've got hopefully within the next few weeks i'll be rolling out a couple of fur items um made with with fur from last season so forget about this you know coronavirus has got the the fur market shut down whatever man you know nobody's buying beaver tails anyways um so that's just something that a lot of us are chunking it's an opportunity that i'm trying to take advantage of there's there's demand there's people this is just a a unique product and a lot of people are interested in it um and you know i'm I'm trying to figure out the same thing with with my fur you know this uh this this raccoon here that i had tan last year uh probably wouldn't have been worth my time to uh, flesh it and stretch it for what i would have got it um what I would have sold it for if um, it would have sold. Because if I'd have sent it last year, it'd be sitting at the NAFA warehouse right now, not sold. <laughs> so, um, man, I, I encourage y'all. I, I don't have any success stories, great success stories. Um, I'm trying to figure all this out too. But um, don't be, don't hesitate to try to think outside the box and uh, you know come up with something. That's that's the really neat thing is, man, all this stuff, you know, all this leather stuff can be made handmade right in your right in your shed with very minimal tools you know i'm 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 machine sewing this stuff um but you don't have to have a a sewing machine you can you can do it with uh some hand tools and i'm gonna hopefully within the next few weeks i'll have a video kind of showing you that um and so if that's something that you're interested in doing trying out um stay tuned and heck let me know let me know if that's something you are interested in and uh, otherwise i hope you're enjoying the uh nuisance trapping series here the next 
couple episodes, we're gonna we're gonna hit pricing kind of hard, and uh, I think hope it's gonna be really valuable. I think it is. Um, you know, there's there's a there's not much information that I found that's put out specifically around how to charge. You know, it's it's very vague stuff about you know you know figure up what your costs are. And, um, you know, I, I can't tell you what to charge because I don't know what your costs are. Well, I'm gonna get I'm gonna roll out. I got I got a spreadsheet that I put together that um you can plug in, you can take what I've got, you can plug in your own costs, your own numbers, you can add more columns to it, but um, it kind of calculates um, a, a rate that that gives you an idea, anyway, of what you maybe probably should at least consider charging. Um, so I hope that's going to be really valuable. I, I think that's something that's going to be simple enough, and, and hopefully once people look at that, they'll really click and think, realize, man, you know, I'm not... Uh, either I am, I'm nailing it, and I'm I'm getting paid more than what I'm worth, or uh, you know I'm really not charging what I need to be because uh, I got a lot of expenses here that I'm not accounting for. So um, anyway, stay tuned for that. Hope y'all are staying safe, coronavirus free, and um, getting ready. I know I've, I've been seeing some pictures on Facebook and and Instagram, and I know some of y'all are out there hitting it hard, hitting them coyotes hard uh, right here around nesting season, fawning season coming up, turkeys, turkeys laying and quail laying. Uh, and actually the next episode is going to be specifically around um, some data from um, quail plantations that run trapping programs. So um, a little, a little tie in there, but anyway, enough teasers. Let's get into the, the interview with Stephen Van Tassel. Thank y'all for listening. Be sure to subscribe, uh, like, give me a comment and let me know what you're thinking and we'll catch you next time. So one thing you talked about earlier in the in the discussion that I wanted to circle back to was contracts, the importance of contracts. So if you're a if you're a new guy just getting into the industry, you know how do you how do you find a, a contract that's appropriate for the wildlife control industry? Well, uh, that's a great question. I have uh, published my contract, and that is available. Uh, if people want to email me, I will send them a copy. Normally, it's with someone buys one of my books. I send them the, uh, I'll send them the contract, but you know, we're, we're on here. So it'll be a, uh, a gift for your, uh, listeners who want it so they can email me to say, Hey, Steven, I want the contract. Now I want everyone to understand that this is the start. You, sure. would, you, you want to be sure that you take this contract and you bring it to your lawyer. Uh, get a lawyer that is competent in business law in your state. That's important. It's because all st every state has their own little nuances about what's legal and what's not legal. And so you need to get an attorney. This is part of that business side of things, right? This is why you have to charge what you do because you're going to have to pay your lawyer <laughs> and, and they're not cheap, right? So what, what the contract will do for you is at least it gives your, uh, your lawyer something to start with because you're going to pay a lot more if he or she has to start from scratch. Right. And so it's basically, and you know, and I would encourage you to read it first, uh, edit it, you know, put it into Microsoft word, make it your own. Cause you're going to have to, you know, change the name and stuff, things of this nature. You're going to know, maybe, you know, some things that are going to be already that you want to change on it and then bring it to your lawyer and have your lawyer review it and say, hey, is this going to be legal in my state or, or my location? And so that's basically how you would want to start. Remember, a, a contract is a contract's helpful for two reasons. The first reason is that it, it forces people to be clear in their communication. So it's a communication device. You know, the fact is most clients, you know, I, I was a little sarcastic with the, with the suing earlier to be sure. Um, and, but it's more true than it should be, but sure. it, it, thankfully it's not an everyday occurrence, right? But a contract forces you to be sure you're clear with your client about the cost and what you're going to do and what you're not going to do. So it's a conversation piece because the reality is for the vast majority of customers, they just want the problem solved for the price that you promised to do it for. Um, and so having that conversation in the, in the fact is many, many lawsuits actually occur because the business owner failed to tr 
treat the customer with a semblance of respect. Now, there's always going to be exceptions to that, but we're trying to, but the most, the majority, I, I have a friend of mine, he was part of a, a lawsuit recently, um, and he told me he, he was, uh, you know, he, he wasn't a party to it in the sense it wasn't his company or anything, but he was brought in as, uh, as some support, and he was telling me about it, and I was flabbergasted. The, the wildlife control operator could have easily have re, have stopped this lawsuit by just not ignoring the client. You know, when the client says, I'm still hearing a noise in the attic, right? don't just assume your client's crazy. You know, they might just be hearing something. And the reality is, if it's the lady of the house, you probably want to believe her because they hear things that most men ignore. Right. So uh, I know that's very sexist, but you do get out in the field and you'll find it's true. Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing is then the legal side. It's to, so that if your client stiffs you and that's happened, I've been involved in a few small claims courts that you have the documentation necessary. Plus the contract notifies that you have permission to trespass on their property. Sure. You know, and sometimes that can be very helpful. Uh, to make sure that, hey, why are, how are, why are you out here? Well, I have permission from the owner to, to be here. And so if something goes wrong, you can show the police, I'm not just some guy putting a ladder up on their house doing something. It's I have a legitimate reason to be here. Right. So, so that's what the contract is for. It helps communication and then the legal side, uh, that it gives you some protection as well. No, that's, I think that's a very important thing that then that's that's the whole reason that i'm going through this this series is all the points that you've covered is that you know trappers we're not for one we're not you know to do this to wildlife control you got to be a salesman you can't be just a trapper and uh you know like you said all the interpersonal skills and then uh, i mean you hit on all the key points of pricing you know not only do trappers undervalue what they bring to the table they don't also consider all the expenses that really go into actually performing the job That's correct. Um, and so and then you know this uh you know it, it's not especially like you said when you get into exclusion work mm -hmm. you can have a three four five thousand dollar bill and yep. you do that work and then the 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 homeowner just all of a sudden starts ignoring your calls that's, That's right. A, that puts you in a bind in a hurry. So. It can, and you know, and I've been in a, you know, I did a small claims court once, uh, well, a couple times actually, and I had to, you know, it was dealing with a landlord that was not very respectable, and uh, you know, I want, cause he didn't show up to the small claims, and so small claims, if the one party doesn't show up, the other party automatically wins. So I, so just winning didn't mean anything. I had to go through the whole sheriff subpoena issue. I then had to have that he still blew all that off. And finally, at the court date where it was going to be a bench summons, a bench warrant being issued, uh, that was the day he showed up and he paid me before the court, before oh. the court meeting occurred. Right. But right to the bitter end, you know, and so it was months. Thankfully, it wasn't a sizable amount of money because it could break you. you know? sure. So this is why. This is why business is hard. And so I, I encourage people, if you're looking to start your own, you want to go full time, let's talk about full time here, or even part time, make sure your, your, your spouse, your girlfriend, your significant other, whatever, make sure they're on board and make sure they're on board, not just, well, we, we want you to be happy, honey, and we want, you need them to be on board full on support because the pro the challenge the challenge with self employment is that your job never goes away right. see one of the things in my job you know I'm a 9 to you know 8 to fiver you know I hour lunch right 8 to fiver when i walk out the door i'm done when you're self employed you're not done there's paperwork. There's that two o'clock phone call in the middle of the night with a bat in someone's bedroom. Make sure you get the credit card number before you turn the key 
of your vehicle, right? It never leaves, and, and some people can handle that stress. Some people can't. I I can't. I I, I admire entrepreneur. I don't have that. I, I need. I must. I'm a second in command guy. I need. I need to to work for someone, uh, and, and help them. But I, I. It's the stress that I can't deal with, right? And so, I want people to be. I'm not trying to crush your dreams here. I'm trying to make sure that you don't make certain mistakes because people have caught. It's cost relationships. It's cost health. It's cost economic. So certainly, you know, part time, definitely. You know, if that's something you want to do, why not? A lot of people have part-time works. Absolutely. But make sure that you're not living to work. You're working to live. Right. Your job is to make sure that you go to Disney World on vacation, not your client going to Disney World on vacation. And so because you have to understand your family suffers with some of this as well. And I think sometimes people get involved in self-employment because it's it's not about the money it's about an e a need for them to feel important and the need for them to feel in charge uh and that's and you know self-employment can give that to you but it comes at a cost that sometimes people aren't really willing to fully understand what that's going to cost them down the road yeah uh, and so be careful i rec if you're going to read a book i would recommend the e-myth uh, yeah. For a book, uh, the E Myth, and what that book basically is—it's uh, not mine, uh, but it's—it's it's a book that basically explains that if you're not creating a business that you can sell or have someone work for you, then you really haven't gained—you really probably haven't gained a whole lot of freedom or economic security. And a lot of people get into self-employment because they say, well, I really love doing this. It would be really cool to do it all the time. Once you make it your livelihood, everything changes. The fun changes. Absolutely. It's the, it's the paperwork. It's the headaches with your client. And so uh, be, think about what that cost is going to be. I, I think one of my errors when I started was I, I was newly married, and I think it was if I had to do it over, I would have I would have either not gone in self-employment at that time or I would have waited a while before I before I did it or because it because it was a cost. And I think that there was. A, so think about it. Just go through. Think about it. Good and hard, everybody. No, it's a, it's a lot to consider from from all aspects, you know, Absolutely. and it's not uh, <clears throat> from guys. You know, you, I've heard of people talking about uh, being worried that their you know, their employees may try to. See, think how easy it is and may try to go off on their own. But the, the reality is, even if somebody does try to do that, um, you know, there's got to be a, a serious drive and determination. That, and once you realize how much work it really is, That's right. um, you know, it, it's a lot easier to get a paycheck from somebody else than try to try to make your own. So it is. And I, and I do think that we do have a serious labor problem in our industry. Um, you know, that's that's probably the, one of the biggest factors that prevents wildlife control operators from growing is the challenge of labor, because you really have to have a special set of skills, you know, the ladder work, dealing with animals, dealing with the client, dealing with some very dirty, potentially nasty, dangerous locations. Um, and, and, and so, and we're not charging enough. And so this is, I mean, if there, if you had a choice, I mean, if I had to do it over again, I would have gone into pest control. Yeah. Far more money, uh, a lot less work, you know, squirt, squirt. I know I'm being a little sarcastic here. I mean, <laughs> some of the pest controllers are going to be really angry at me. But when you compare that with crawling through an attic uh, at, in the middle of the summer at 120 degrees versus, you know, doing a cockroach clean out or something, and that could be kind of nasty, but it's it's different, you know. And so there's also that residual income you have with the pest control uh, business where you're coming back every month or you're coming back quarterly. You know, a lot of times people, when they're getting later in their career, they say, well, you know, I have this great wildlife business, but they can't sell it. Right. And that's a dirty little secret we have in our industry. That is, you, there are some very successful businesses out there and they can't sell. Because when you really break it down, what do they have? 
They don't. Yeah. They don't. They have really nothing. They right. have because they have equipment that's going to be sold at probably thirty percent or fifty percent of face value because it's used. Yeah. And they don't have, and they may get money for some business their 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 uh, customer list. But that you know, but most of my customers that I had when I was in business, I never saw them again. Right. Because the reality is, if you do the job right, you'll never see that client again. Yep. So we have challenges in our industry that we that the pest control field doesn't have because for the pest control field, those bugs are coming back sooner or later. You know. Yeah. Um, so that's a real that's a real challenge for us, and I I, I struggle with how do we how do we build the the longer term value. Uh, I, I, gosh, we're, we're just not there yet. And I, unless we have the regulation that allows someone to uh, have a, a two-tiered system, a lot of pest control states have two-tiered systems. You have to work for someone for two years before you can go out and get your own pest control license right. uh, as a standalone business. Where in, in Montana, for instance, we don't even have a wildlife control license. You can start your business tomorrow. Okay, You can waltz in here and... You're good to go, so you don't need a license at all. Uh, if you want a fur trap, that you have to wait six months. <laughs> okay, but um, uh, you don't, you know. So for other states, you can just be a resident and you can get your fur trap once you pass your fur trapping license and get your wildlife control operator's license. You can be out on your own. So that fear that companies have of losing their employees is a real one. Yeah, I would respond that. How do you create an atmosphere in your company to where they don't want to leave? Right. And so I've wondered why many companies don't look at their senior employees, the guys who are really producing, and say, you know what, let me, let me give you some shares in this company. Because if you incorporate, you have to have a certain amount of shares in your company. So I don't know... I, it just puzzles me as to why they don't look at that employee and say, look, you have been very good for our business. We want to bring, we want to keep you here. We want to give you a piece of this company. Um, and we're going to give you a certain set of shares and give them a percentage of the company. Right. So that at the end of the year, they're getting some of that profit that the company has developed. And now they have, they have ownership. They're not just an employee, but they're a, an owner. Right. As well. And I, I don't know why more wildlife control uh, companies haven't done that. Um, I mean, the fact is most wildlife control operators are single person operations. But for those that are the bigger companies, I, I think that would be an interesting thing to try to see if that would help. Yeah. So, I don't know. Yeah, that's definitely a, a lot to, to consider, a lot to think about. Um, so, well, man, we're we're bumping just over an hour, and uh, I want to be respectful of your time. So, if you unless you if you got anything else to add, feel free. I always I always got something left. I talk for a living, so yeah. I've always got something to add. Well, uh, why, don't you, why don't you give us you know how we could folks could contact you, follow you. All uh, right, let's do that. Let me uh let me pull out one of my business cards here, and let me uh, put it up to the screen. Uh, how about that? I think I got one with me. Yeah, there we go. All right, let me try and see if I got this up right. Let me put it a little closer. And is that coming through for you? It's a little blurry, but... All right, have a little closer. There we go. All right. So there you go. There's me. All right, so leave it up there. Uh, so email me uh, if you want that copy of the contract. I'll uh, just say, hey, I saw it on the podcast or whatever, you know, the name of the podcast. So otherwise, uh, if you don't give me the name of the podcast... I won't send it to you. Uh, I do want to at least push my book. I think I've got one of them here. Here's one of them. Uh, got a couple of books. So here's one of my books here. This is uh, one I'm really proud of. This is the third edition of the Wildlife damage inspection handbook so basically this is a uh, 100 and 180 pages of information on how to identify 
wildlife sign. A lot of people think that, oh, well, I'm a hunter, I'm a trapper. It's 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 not a hunting book. It's uh, it's not a fur trapping book. It's a book to help you understand what the damage is going to look like from a wildlife control perspective. Right. So that um, you know, it talks about the process of inspection. Uh, and by the way, let me just put an announcement out here. If you're doing free inspections, please stop. Um, stop. Uh, I would really encourage you to rethink that. Uh, we don't, I don't believe in free inspections from a wildlife control side of things. If you're talking about a massive bird job, that I can understand. But for, right. uh, because that, that's a little different. But in terms of, you know, someone wanting, a, I used to quote stuff right over the phone. And they'll say, oh, can you come out? Ma'am, I've already given you a quote. If I come out, it's this price for me to show up. Because right. when we're doing an, when you do an inspection for someone's property, you should be telling that person all of the potential problems that that house has in terms of animals getting in. So you're not just simply saying, oh yeah, you got, you know, you have cockroaches, you have mice. You're going deeper than that. You're crawling in that attic. You're looking around that house. You're investigating and you're giving this person a quality inspection. Uh, so you're doing more than that. You need to be paid for it. I, I think that plus you get rid of the tire kickers. I mean, you're right. our time. Time is such a valuable commodity for wildlife control operators because it's such a time intensive business. Uh, you've got to guard that time value. Your life is valuable and your skill is viable. Uh, so here's a book uh, with uh, Phil Nichols. Some of you may know Phil back in the day. Uh, so I've revised his book, uh, The Wildlife Pest Control Handbook. Uh, so that's another one. And then this is my, uh, I, I purchased this book. This is called uh, Being Kind to Animal Pests. People say, well, why are you writing this animal rights book? Oh, this is not an animal rights book. It's an animal welfare book. Because remember when I said cage traps really aren't all that humane? Right. This is a book that teaches you how to use cage traps humanely. You know, and this is something I would encourage fur trappers. Look, we cause, uh, stop lying to people. Cona bears don't kill instantly. They don't. Okay. If you think they do. Show me the research. I would love to see it because all the research I've seen, they don't die instantly. Okay. Right. They're not even unconscious instantly. Okay. So uh, that's, we need to stop lying to people about that. Just like I want the animal rights protest industry to stop lying. We need to stop lying. The truth matters. Okay. So uh, we need to stop lying about that. But, but the same way. So part of the reason I did this is I wanted people to realize that cage traps aren't humane. And so they say, well, are they more cruel than a foothold? Well, they may cause less injury in some ways than a, than a foothold. It depends. The problem with all of these bans is they forget. We like to ban equipment in America. We always think that equipment is somehow magical. We always think there's a technological solution for everything, right? You, you ban the gun and that's going to solve the problem. No, it's not going to solve the problem. Same way banning the trap doesn't solve the problem. You have to have equipment with the person using the equipment. It's a combination of the tool with the user. So just like you don't use a hammer to drive a screw, you don't use a foothold necessarily in every situation, but there are plenty of situations where you want to use a foothold. I, sure. you know, I used to ask people, uh, they say, well, if, uh, I said, if footholds are so cruel, why were they using them to, to translocate river otters to restore them in America? And they'll look at you. I said, oh, I'll, look, I'll say, I'll be, I'm a sarcastic person if you haven't figured that out yet. Um, I'll to look at them and I'll say, oh, you didn't know that? And then I'll look at him and I'll say, well, I wonder why you didn't know that. So why don't they know that? Well, because fish and wildlife agencies are hideous in getting that information out. Right. And trappers are certainly hideous in getting it out. But as well as is that the animal rights people certainly aren't going to tell people that we use footholds to, to get river otters restored. Right. I said, and I said, you know why we're using those rather than cage traps? because they cause less injury. Yep. That's counterintuitive, isn't it? And I'll say, you know why? Because they would bite the cage, break their teeth, and that wouldn't grow back. But they had foot injury, but that wouldn't get healed. Right. That's the difference, right? So I tell people, look, they say, well, does footholds hurt? Well, of course they hurt. Yes, they hurt. Let's, 
that's life. I mean, that's the way it is. Guns hurt too. Um, so anyways, the point is that we have to be careful about how we phrase things, right? Mm -hmm. So, and then my first book was this one. This is the wildlife removal handbook. This is the one, if you want to start in business, the one I would recommend. Uh, and so that is uh, third edition, revised and expanded. So that one's certainly available. I have one more, I think. I don't think I have it up here. I have one on the feral cat control because uh, we all know that free range cats are an environmental menace. And if you love nature, you want to get rid of free ranging cats. Um, so people think I'm a cat hater. I'm not a cat hater. I used to own cats, but they were indoor cats. Right. Right. So if you want to know why America hates nature, they let their cats roam free. So that's how we know America hates nature. Yeah, so. you're, you're spot on with that. <laughs> so I also saw the, on your blog that you are currently writing another control manual. Is that something you can talk about? Or? Uh, yeah, I sure can. It's the, well, this is the Wildlife Control Operator Training Course. Uh, this is a the two-day training workshop from the National Wildlife Control Operators Association. So okay. this was their two-day training. So uh, a lot of people think it's basic. Uh, in one sense, it is, but we've had people who've been in business 10 years who have taken the class and they're like, wow, I, they were amazed at how much they learned. But we, it is actually a, it's a, I would rather call it a foundational course. It's a two-day class that gives you all the fundamentals of doing wildlife control uh, from understanding the history, laws, safety issues, animal handling, equipment, uh, euthanasia, carcass disposal. Those are, you know, if we're trapping and killing stuff, you're not all just translocating everything, right, everybody? You're not just dumping it down the road. That's illegal in Massachusetts and several other states. You can't do it with rabies vector species, right? Right. Yeah, right. So um, in any event, uh, you have to, so if you're going to kill it, you've got to, how do you kill it? Um, so carbon dioxide is typically what we would suggest when we talk about other methods as well. And then we get into detail on the control of uh, bats, tree squirrels, raccoons, skunks, and unprotected birds. And so those uh, species or species groups are selected because if you know how to control those, you have the skill set to control anything else. That doesn't mean you'll be great at it. I mean, coyote work obviously is a different world, right? But in terms of, but you have the fundamentals, the foundation, so you can read a book and now, oh, I understand what this is saying. And then you can apply those skills to that type of work. And so people are, uh, it's, it's quite a training. So I'm creating the, we were just printing the PowerPoints as the manual. And the association wanted something that was, you know, a little bit more professional looking in a book. Sure. So right now, uh, that book is, um, oh, 170 pages, eight and a half by 11, somewhere in there. So it's, uh, it's not quite, it's, the substance is pretty much there, uh, but it's, yeah, about 170 pages, double column. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's going to be something else. So, so is that, is that one of the trainings is offered at the, the expo? Yes, it's all, it's offered at the expo, but it's also offered uh, at regional events. And so you don't have to, if you have, uh, let's say a state association, if you're part of a state trappers association or something, or we've had private businesses call NUCOA and they say, Hey, we want to offer the training. We, we will come to you. You don't have to come to one of our assigned events. Um, we will come to you. We've had businesses say, you know what? I want all of my technicians trained, uh, and we will we'll pay to have new COA come. So if, if uh, the rule of thumb, it's not a requirement, but the rule of thumb is you get about 20, 20 people. Uh, and you're looking at, uh, I, I want to get, I want to be careful with numbers because I'm not in charge of all that, but, uh, sure. but you could get, so you could have uh, new COA come and new COA gives you a, a, a flat rate, what that's going to cost for up to 20 people. If you make more money than that, then you make more money than that. 
right? So you're just paying the code. We bring in our instructors, we bring the materials, give the training, there's an exam at the end, grade the exam, people that pass get their certificates and people that don't can have an opportunity to retest at a later date. Um, so uh, that's basically it, but we, we will come to you. That's not that a problem. People, that certificate is the uh, certified wildlife control operator permit. Is that what, is that what it is? Not a permit, no, because we're not right. a government agency, but that right. is a uh, that is our certification, and we are working to get more states to accept that, as in lieu of any other training that state may require. But a lot a lot of states don't require any training. How, how successful have y'all been? Like Georgia requires a state training, a state test, it, but it's, it's hard. We lobbied Georgia. We actually, I think, gave a, gave a copy of our training manual to them. It's getting the it's getting that regulatory change made. It's very hard, and so we have it. I believe in. Uh, we have our bat standards accepted in Virginia. I think our wildlife control operator training is accepted in North Carolina. Uh, trying to think of other other states where it's accepted. Uh, there, I think Kentucky is coming on board soon, but it's a slow process. Like in here, like here in Montana, there'd be no need because we've got nothing. Right. So, so yeah. Uh, I'm sure Fish, Wildlife, and Parks would be happy to have you take the test, but it's not necessary. Right. Right. So this is where it's a slow go. Yeah. And this is part of the, this is where people get discouraged. And that is the politics. Uh, when you're dealing with people in wildlife control, they're often, you know, they're self-employed, hard drivers. They want things like this. Politics isn't like that. And a lot of people don't realize the long haul it takes to get regulations passed. It's a lot of work. And I tell people, look, do you think the animal rights people got their successes just in a few years? No, they've been working on this since what, the 20s? Yeah, long time. Long time. And we have people dedicated their lives to this. They wake up every day trying to think of how can I put the screws to the fur industry? Right. And that right. every day, that's what they're doing. That's their mission. It's their religion. And so we have to have some when we have the associations that need support, like the NTA and the FTA, where they're trying to work. It takes money to do that. People yep. say, oh, it's money. It also takes people to do it, to lobby their legislatures where you're voting and you're picking up a phone and calling the office and saying, hey, I'm a fur trapper. This is important to me. This is part of my livelihood. And unfortunately, this is part of that message. Uh, we can punch above our weight if we want to, but it takes a lot of work. Sure. And a lot of people, a lot of trappers have the attitude of, if I just be quiet, people will leave me alone. That's not, no, that, no. What that, what that means is, oh, I can bully you even more. Exactly. And that's, and that's a challenge that we have. Um, and so, because again, fur trappers just want to be left alone. Unfortunately, yeah. we're in a culture that won't leave you alone. Right. Well, and if, you, if you're quiet, you're going to get, uh, you're going to get rolled over. Exactly. exactly. And so this is the challenge and it's, you know, it's, I, I fear that we'll lose, I figure in the next 20 years, fur trapping for all practical purposes will be over. Yeah. Uh, and, and for a couple of reasons, the bulldozer, that's one of the problems. Sure. Uh, you know, we're losing habitat and we're also losing, you know, you go to a trapper's convention. What's the average age? 60, maybe. <laughs> yeah. 50, 60. They're all gray. Right. Oh, you know? and that's, we're losing, we're losing a generation. And so, and that's why I tell people, look, you want to, if you hate fur trappers, then you're going to get more wildlife control operators. Right. You're either going to have it done for free or you're going to be paying for it. Pick, make your choice. Yeah. And that's, and culturally that's where we're going. Yeah. So I've got a question for you and you may decide, you may prefer not to answer it, but it's something that, that I wonder about and you with your 
uh, especially probably more exposure out west. But yep. how do you see the the USDA Wildlife Services and the nuisance wildlife control operators? There is a love hate relationship there. Um, so there is certainly because in some cases, uh, particularly it's more it's more prevalent in the East Coast than it is out here in the West. But there have been some challenges here in the West. I, I would have to contact some people to, to see if I'm correct that. But certainly in the East, where Wildlife Services was was perceived, whether actually or reality, I don't want to get into the guilty whatever. I just want to talk about how perceptions are. Sure. Um, where they were perceived to be competing with private industry. Right. So certainly that makes, uh, you know, if you're a private business owner and you've lost a contract because wildlife services has come in, you're going to be upset yeah. because your attitude is going to be here. You have a, you're competing against the government. Who's going to win that fight? Right. So uh, I think this is one of the things that Nuco was involved with. Um, gosh, how long ago was it? Five six years ago where there was a upper level meeting between NUCOA and wildlife services. And there was sort of an, a kind of an agreement that kind of took out, uh, came to the forefront. And then there was like a sort of a white paper that was issued from wildlife services that said that they were not going to be involved with certain size towns. They would not be getting into those locations. Uh, which gave them the space for the smaller communities. Like I'm in a town of 6,000, right? So right. we don't have a wildlife control operator here uh, unless you consider me one and I can't compete against private business with my job. Uh, but, you know, most Montanans just put the gun out the window and just, <laughs> you know, just, just shoot it. Um, so, we're, but in terms of what other areas that is, so it seems like that's taking care of a lot of the problem. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I haven't heard as much about that type of competition and competitors, but there's a, there's a, some tension there to be sure. Uh, I, I try to, I, I see it from both sides. And so I try to remind my, my wildlife control operator friends, and I try to tell them it's look, not, not everything, what you're experiencing in the East coast is different than what we're going to experience here in Montana and the West. I mean, when I first arrived in Montana, it's it's breathtaking how empty it is. Yeah. And it's hard. And I'm from Massachusetts, right? We have, uh, I was from Springfield, home of Springfield Rifle, basketball, you know, the uh, basketball museum, uh, Hall of Fame is there, you know, um, it's urban. Okay. It's an urban area. We have, you know, drive, we you know, drive 40 minutes and you're up in the, Mount Holyoke College, UMass, Springfield, uh, Smith College, Amherst College, Hampshire College. It's all, we're all there, the Pioneer Valley. It's a lot of people. Coming out here, I talked to a rancher and I said, how big is your ranch? And I didn't realize it was rude to ask that question, but he, <laughs> he didn't realize it was rude for me to ask. So he told me, he says 15 square miles. Think about that. His one a contiguous land owner, 15 square miles. That's Tim, a staggering uh, amount of, that's a staggering amount of space, right? right? So clearly out here, we don't have a problem with too much competition. We have a problem with labor. We need labor. Okay. Right. So, but I also want to remind our wildlife control brethren this and that is when they say they oppose wildlife services which part of wildlife services are you opposing and they'll look at me a little puzzled and i'll say well because there's different branches of wildlife services there is the field service activity of wildlife services there's also the research side of wildlife services so right. i said which one are you opposing and they'll say, oh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm not opposing the research. I said, so you're not opposed to all wildlife services. Right. You're opposed to the field application of wildlife services. Okay. I said, now let me ask you another question. Wildlife services is often involved in airports. Do you really want a private company 
running the bash program that's the bird airstrike hazard group where they go out and they haze birds and they try to keep birds from striking planes uh and they'll be like well i would like an opportunity to bid on that and i said but think about it if you you know lowest bidder would you feel safer and, and i'm not talking about you know netting you know, netting jobs is different. I think that should be probably private, right? But right. but because wildlife services isn't doing netting jobs. That's just not what they're doing. But do you really want private? Sir, I'm not sure I want it, you know, and I'm a kind of a low, I'm a small government kind of guy, but I'm not sure I want it. You know, I think there's a place for government. The other thing that people don't understand is that part of wildlife services job is to be on call when there is a zoonotic hazard anywhere in the world. Right. A lot of the guys have hazard pay, or what's called like emergency pay, meaning that the government can tell them you need to be on a plane in 48 hours. Going to Timbuktu, anywhere in the world, it's not just the United States, to handle uh, a certain outbreak. I said, do you really think a private company can do that? And so it's so I, I appreciate the you know, that maybe wildlife services needs to get smaller. I mean, I could appreciate that. But to say that it's eliminated, to be eliminated, I'm not, I'm not quite sure that that is a good idea at this time. Right. Uh, the, and the other thing I tell people is that, remember, when wildlife service goes away, the animal rights protest industry needs to get another revenue source. And that's going to be us. Yeah. So, or the fur trappers, but I don't know if there's enough money in the fur trappers. I mean, they might, you know, they've already, they can kind of do whatever they want with the fur trappers. The wildlife control industry may give them more money. Yeah. It's be hard to say how they're going to play that out. Because remember, the, you always need a crisis in order to get people to keep giving to your organization. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? So you can't solve too many of the world's problems too quickly because yeah. you've got to keep the money coming, right? I mean, that's sort of a, that's my, you know, my opinion on how, that, on how that works. Certainly that was probably true in Massachusetts because they, they could have put through whatever they wanted. Mm. You know? And so, like, I asked the question, why didn't they ban mouse traps? Was that a humane trap? I asked, I asked the signer. One of the original 10 signers, I was debating him on television. I said, so what makes this trap humane? He wouldn't answer the question. Huh. See, it was the hypocrisy of it. It was a political move, and he wouldn't yeah. even have the guts to say so. So uh, yeah. I knew what it was. it was. It was hypocrisy is what it was. It's all politics. <laughs> well... So, like I said, I could talk for a long time, but uh, but hopefully your hearers have some information that will put some money in their pocket, protect them and their family. Um, it's an honorable profession. It's an honorable work. You're doing important work for public safety. Just make sure you make enough money to make it worth your while, folks, because you're not 30 forever. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Stephen, I sure appreciate you, you taking All the right. time. Stephen Van Tassel, wildlifecontrolconsultant.com. Yeah. Um, also, you can hear the the Living the Wildlife portion right. of the Pest Geek podcast wherever right. po podcasts are, and so uh, yeah. that's uh, that's definitely worth a listen. Uh, I like I like how you go through and you know read some, take some of the distill some of the research, and uh, that stuff just from from my perspective and and having a wildlife degree and all. Uh, that research stuff is not easy to break down into usable formats a lot of times. So, yeah, you're right. I don't have a wildlife degree unless unless you have one. I I don't have a wildlife degree. My my de my degrees are in uh, in theology and um, I have a degree in education. Gotcha. Yeah, I do. So, I do. I've got a I've got a wildlife biology degree, yeah. and that's that's kind of where I got exposed to the research side. And I knew real okay. quick that that was not something I was really interested in. So. Well, so what did you, uh, so what, so what topics, one of the challenges that I have is I don't get enough feedback from my listeners. So, um, I just tend to talk about what I'm interested in. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but what if, if you had, uh, topics that would be of particular interest to you, what would you, what would you like? You know, um, I would say probably, Kind of some of those those top ones that you talked about in the uh, the Nukoa trainings, flying okay. squirrels in the in the south here. Yeah. Um, 
that's that's one that that uh is a a real challenge okay uh, and uh so nukoa training you want me to like detail uh, literally expound what those trainings are all about well i think you uh, uh was it fred what was it you you get you did an interview with a, a guy from nuco and y'all kind of went through that oh yeah greg shoemaker is our yeah, uh, greg. yeah greg, greg shoemaker is our training coordinator yeah no, but just just going through some of the, uh, uh, you know, any kind of, I don't know how much research is out there, but, uh, you know, flying squirrels, okay. how, you know, effective ways to trap them, because really the, what I've run across and, and most of the folks that I've talked to is, you know, it, the you got to find where their entry holes are, and that's yes. how you trap them. Or you can even exclude them and not even trap them at all. Well, and, and that's maybe that's one that would be worth doing is, okay. you know, exclusion because that's one that I see a lot of debate about is, uh, you know, if if just exclusion, is that adequate for, you know, how how likely is that animal to try to come in and find another way back in, uh, particularly question. dealing with squirrels and things? OK, I will. Uh, I can certainly I can certainly do a podcast on that. Yeah. OK, that's helpful. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. Well, that's, uh, if you come up with something else or your audience, uh, I, it, it's, uh, sometimes it's not easy trying to figure out what your audience wants because I don't, I don't get much feedback from the audience. So, but I'm really gratified that it's getting out there and some people are listening to it and at least enjoying it, if nothing else, be entertained, if not informed, as I like to say. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> and and uh, that's, I think, I think things are slowly, um, there's more information and more people, you know, trapping. Uh, well, I've kind of talked with other people. Trapping tends to be 10 to 20 years behind in technology and things like that. Uh, and so, yeah, I, do you think that's changing though? I think I've seen, um, I, I just think I've seen some interesting stuff that's come out of for trapping. I mean, some new footholds that are out there that are, they're like Cadillac type footholds. And, um, certainly a lot of the cage work there's been some technology changes in the cage work and then i wonder if there's been some greater development in the area of of baiting i just wonder i think there's a greater level of scientific integrity in some of the work that's been done in for fur trappers i think fur trappers sell themselves short uh in the sense that they're what i would call the old school naturalist Remember, a lot of science that was science back in the day was people going out in the woods and just watching and just yeah. being observant. Um, I had, remember, um, uh, gosh, what was his name? He wrote a whole bunch of book, tra trapping books. He just passed away several years ago. Uh, not o not O'Gorman. What is he? He wrote a lot of like the, uh, wrote a book on uh, trap trap staking systems and Charlie Dobbins. Dobbins. Yes. Yep. Dobbins. I read, I looked at his book on fox trapping and then I read a book in, from the Smithsonian Institution of a guy who did his dissertation on red fox. It was amazing how much Dobbins said, what Dobbins said matched what the PhD guy said. Oh. Now Dobbins, to my knowledge, didn't have a PhD. But, you know, he didn't have the degree, but he had the ability to pay attention to let the animals teach him, yeah, right? Nice. And so, you know, I'm not trying to put down education or degrees. That's not my point here. I just want to make sure that people don't devalue their knowledge and their experience. You know, when I talk to, when you have some trappers are more observant than others, some are trying to, they're more, they think about, how that animal is acting and they're trying to be as careful with the data as possible they're taking good notes when they're trapping and so they have some hard data it's not just their memory they're relying on right um those types of individuals have sometimes insights that we're never going to get because no one's going to pay to have the quote unquote scientific research done yeah. um, which is sad so don't sell yourself short folks this is an old school naturalist which i think we've kind of lost uh, we've gotten too analytical and we're we're missing well, what are we doing with this information uh, what can we do with it 
And so I, I, I think there's insights being brought to bear all the time. You guys just don't get credit for it. Yep. I, I think you're, I think you're right. And I think there is a lot of innovation, but, um, yep. you know, trappers, like you say, being, being kind of self-contained and quiet and not, you know, a lot of that stuff, I'm sure some of that stuff probably dies with, with yeah, one or maybe it, two people. It, it breaks my heart. Um, if you have, if you know, you guys out there that are building new traps or you're building, you know, you want to keep things secret. Oh, okay. I get it. Keep it secret, but at least write it down somewhere. So when you pass, your children can at least sell it. Yeah. <laughs> Because, <laughs> because uh, you know, I had a guy, I, I, I write books, right? And so I talked to a guy, he had a particular beaver beaver trapping technique. And I said, well, are you, I said, you're interested in writing a book on it. You know, it doesn't have to be a big book. You know, it could be 30, 40 pages, right? And he said, well, you know, I'm, I just, I'm still doing my work. I said, that's fine. We can write it and put it aside. And then when you're ready, I mean, I didn't want to say, you know, wait till you die, but when, when you're ready, we'll publish it when you're ready. And you, oh, you know, and so what happens is, is people, this stuff dies with them. Yep. Because, you know, I'm always amazed at the number of people that don't have wills. Because, you know, if you write your will, you're going to die. And so as long as you don't write it, you're going to live forever. Uh, folks, we've had situations, you know, talk to Alan Hewitt of Wildlife Control Supplies. He'll tell you stories of people that had formulas they passed away and no one knows what the formula was. Oh. And they had a really valuable, you know, whether it be a product or something, no one knows how to do it. Right. And that's a shame. Um, one, because the industry, we need good tools. We have so few as it is, you know, and we don't want to lose this stuff, but also it's a, a way of sometimes helping your, your, your heirs get some residual income for something that you've learned. You know, um, and that's a shame. Well, and, and there, like you said, too, about, um, you know, the, the ability to sell, you know, something, you know, a business, uh, right. any of that stuff, you know, just goes just goes even further for that. So, Absolutely. you know, and I think we've you know, I look, you know, we thank God for you know, Dobbins. If he wasn't giving all of his quote unquote secrets away, where would we be? You yeah. know, him and the, him and the host of others that were out there doing the good work of telling what they, of what they did. It helped. It brought our industry out of the stone age, basically. Yeah. So we got to be grateful. And so I, you know, I remind people sometimes they'll say, well, there's secrets, you know, it, sometimes they're not really secrets. It's just that people may have had two different ways of doing things. Sometimes people say, well, I don't want to tell people how to do it because then I'll lose all this money. Sometimes it's true, but look at how many different books there are out there on carpentry. Yeah. But you know what? I still hire someone to do it. Yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> right. So, you know what? It's. I just think that we have to be, uh, you know, not foolish, but there are ways of giving out information that that are. It is so much easier to do nowadays with with uh, e-books and that sort of thing. So, if, if people have books to sell, I'm interested in buying books. As I bought, you know, Nichols's book. If people want to produce a book, I'm I'm a I could be a ghost author for you. So, it's easier than people think. But yeah. think about it, folks. Hey, I really appreciate your time. Steven, I appreciate it too, and uh, we'll we'll keep you posted. And hopefully, we get you get y'all some more listeners over there on the Pesky Podcast sure. too. So yeah, and then, yeah well, hopefully we'll meet again. All right, I appreciate it, Stephen. Thanks Take again. Care. All right, bye bye.